Welcome to the Troy Perry Podcast, and here's your host, Troy Perry. Hey, what's going on, guys? Troy Perry here. It is the Troy Perry Podcast, Episode 5, the final WCW Nitro. You can listen to all my previous podcasts on wrestling over the last 30 years on all popular podcast formats, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you like to listen to your podcasts, you should be able to find the Troy Perry Podcast. Now, this one's dear to me because during the whole Monday Night Wars between WWF Raw, WCW Nitro, I'll watch both shows. I'd watch both uh, organizations' pay-per-views. However, I always had a thing, I was always... I always considered myself a WCW fan before a WWF fan. Now, I did only have access to WWF when I was basically a kid. I was able to access WCW through Oddstar eventually, through the channel TNT. They used to play Nitros on Saturday nights. And at this stage, I was a teenager, so I was able to be at home. I never used to go out too much when I was younger, so... Saturday nights was always me watching WCW Nitro. While Raw would be on a little bit of a later time, uh, I'd be on like a Tuesday night here in Australia, like on um, Fox Sports. However, with Nitro, uh, it was also up to date with what was happening in America. While watching Raw, it was, I believe, two weeks behind for a long period of time. They only caught up to being live connected with Australia to America like once Smackdown came into play but at the time yeah Raw was always two weeks behind Nitro was only a few days behind so yeah Nitro was always my go-to and my favorite wrestler of all time Macho Man Randy Savage was on there um at the time of me watching Nitro regularly uh NWO was killing it they were in the middle of the big feud between uh NWO and the uh, one and only Sting during his whole I'm the Crow, I'm not with WCW, I'm not with NWO, I'm just me phase. And yeah, just always watching Nitro and watching Sting come from the rafters and you never knew when he's going to come. And then if he did, he wouldn't say much or his actions would... Sp- yeah, if anyone's actions sp- spoke louder than words, it would have been Sting in that whole like year of 97 uh early 98 sort of um phase of the wcw um with this last nitro um obviously at the time the build-up for it was it was deemed uh the night of champions where all the titles were going to be defended um it was in the process of being bought by eric bischoff and some backers at the time They were called Fusant Media. Um, They were on the verge of buying WCW and giving it a few months off. Like they were calling basically this last WCW Nitro, the Night of Champions, they were just calling it a season finale, not necessarily the very last Nitro. Um, The plan was to originally give a break for the company for a few months and then bring it back for a pay-per-view called The Big Bang. And it was going to feature mostly the younger guys and obviously some of the older wrestlers if they were willing to take uh, pay cuts. Uh, however, very pretty much within the last week of the final Nitro, uh, Eric Bischoff and company had to pull their offer because AOL Time Warner, who was selling the property, the WCW, uh, all the property regarding it, They were pulling their weekly TV deal on TNT. And that was going to be a deal breaker because WCW makes their money through being shown on TV. So the fact that they're going to pull their weekly TV show um, was a no-go. And yeah, Eric Bischoff couldn't get anything going for other TV networks in such a short period of time. So yeah, they had to pull their offer. And then they even... And then AOL Time Warner eventually reached out to 
Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation or Titan Sports, I believe it was called back here and pretty much said to Vince, please buy us. We're selling the company. So Vince bought everything like the rings, the wrestlers contracts. Um, yeah, well, like the power plant, the, all the merchandise, all the, the, the huge video library, the music. He bought it all for a measly two million stated. Uh, I've heard in other places it was two and a half or three million, but considering at one point WCW was worth a hundred million, um, and even Eric Bischoff and company were going to try and buy the company for about sixty million. The TV deal was there, however, it got pulled, and it was basically worth nothing. And then Vince. Uh, even though today it looks like he just mostly bought it for the video library so he can um, supply original content through documentaries of, or even go into the, uh, the backgrounds of a lot of the wrestlers that started in WCW and end up in WWF or WWE today. Um, it looks like he bought it for the library. At the time, no one was sure. Like Everyone thought it was either going to be basically everyone from WCW come on over to the WWF and basically fight for your spot or even keep it separately, which is what they did for the first six months of the purchase. They basically kept WCW separate from WWF. Uh, yeah, WCW end up even having like either a match on each show or like, I think it might have even been, yeah, I think it was only like one match per show until they built up a storyline the long term that was going to be WCW versus WWF uh, invasion storyline and the whole and then end up being an alliance where it was WCW and ECW formed to versus WWF and then the whole storyline itself it didn't really get over the crowd um, no one really cared too much about the alliance until they had even former WF guys that were supposed to be loyal to WWF join the alliance which was Stone Cold and Kurt Angle and yeah the storyline fell flat and then basically was the death of WCW just in that instant but um yeah at the time the final WCW Nitro um a lot of the wrestlers a lot of the staff uh the commentators uh, yeah well they weren't sure what was going to happen next after this final Nitro night and yeah so the final Nitro yeah it was deemed the night of champions it was held March 26, 2001 in Panama City Beach, Florida, which was uh, a yearly thing that WCW did where they'd go to spring break and they'd have like, I don't know, pools around the ring and just random stuff like that. They did that yearly for, I believe it was like maybe four or five years until this one. And um, yeah, like WF was mostly keen and focused on the younger talent as well as any of the bigger wrestlers that ended up um, uh, on contracts that were pretty low, like buyable. So WF ended up buying the bigger contracts of like Booker T, Buff Bagwell, DDP. Like they all signed for a little bit less than what their contracts were. But yeah, they was definitely not like in the millions like Hogan was and Goldberg was and the outsiders were. So they ended up making more appearances for WWF shortly before them. But uh, this event itself, it started off with Ric Flair coming to the ring, talking about how he can't be bought and how WCW will uh, hold its own legacy and how, yeah, basically was playing the good old baby face and talking about the history of WCW, talking about names like Harley Race and Barry Windham and, yeah, just mentioned even... Those guys as well as the greats. And yeah, and then he wants to have one final match on this WCW Nitro and he wanted it against Sting, who he wrestled on the very first Nitro back in 1995. So yeah, they were hoping for one more go around and yeah, so that was going to happen later on that show. Uh, yeah, the show started with a bang. Um, straight up the... The big match advertised for the event ended up being first, so it was champion versus champion. 
Uh, Scott Steiner was the WCW World Champion, and he was versing Booker T, who was the US Champion. Um, yeah, they've had many matches before this one, so it was basically going to be good unless something uh, drastic happened between uh, moves or whatnot. And um, yeah, even though they only wrestled uh, Lister here's five minutes and eight seconds. Uh, it felt a little bit longer, but it was also full of action in that five minutes. Like, there was no slowdown periods. Um, uh, visually, it looked like Scott Steiner was suffering from an injury. At the time when I watched this, I thought he must have just had some sort of foot injury, but he actually has some sort of uh, condition called drop foot. I haven't looked too much into it, but he had it at this time. So, as you can see, one of his feet are heavily bandaged up. Um, yeah, so he must look like he just gutted it through and... It seemed like it was the genuine professional for at least this night. Um, yeah, he on the very last Nitro, he put Booker T over. Booker T beat him cleanly with the bookend. Um, yeah, Booker T looked... They, WCW were trying to make Booker T very much like The Rock at the time. Like, he had his own catchphrases. He was just super cool. And, yeah, just... Yeah, like, he had the catchphrases of... Uh, don't hate the player, hate the game, and save the drama for your mama. <laughs> and yeah, so they definitely had some catchphrases for him to use, and he heavily used them weekly. Um, yeah, so he ended up leaving that Nitro as a double champion. Um, yeah, it was probably the right decision considering um, how over Booker T was to the fans and how good he would have came off crossover wise for WWF and. Yeah, shortly after WCW got bought out, he was straight into the WF storyline. He was the main guy for WCW uh, for that majority of the storyline. And he carried the WCW title over to um, like events like SummerSlam and stuff. And even though he lost the belt to The Rock, I believe, however, he has genuine respect in the locker room and he's still around today like on like... WWE like panel shows like backstage or the pre-shows on pay-per-views but um yeah he's they probably pulled the trigger a bit late on Booker T um they end up if he was going to get a push and be world champion a lot earlier than he should have it would have been uh during the period where he um got a title shot against Triple H at Wrestlemania I believe it was I'm not sure exactly which WrestleMania it was. I have to look into it. But basically, the storyline was Triple H was the heel champion. Booker T was the underdog babyface. The whole feud between them. Triple H was killing them in promos, killing them in matches. So everyone just assumed Booker T was going to win at this WrestleMania. And um, yeah, he ended up losing cleanly to Triple H. And everyone was, what the hell? Like... And not only that, it made Booker T look super weak because Triple H would hit his pedigree and he literally would take, it felt like years, but it was probably about 20 seconds to roll over to put a hand over Booker T for the pin. And considering the long pause that occurred, everyone actually thought Booker T would kick out and he didn't. And everyone was like, that's it? Like that's, yeah. So that was a pretty bad one to cop as a Booker T fan. And then, yeah, he ended up being King Booker. And then that's when he ended up getting the push as a heel champion, feuding with guys like, uh, I think he ended up winning the title off Rey Mysterio when he had the belt. Um, he also had a good feud with Batista when Batista was on the rise as being one of the main guys. Um, yeah, he ended up commentating for a bit of period. Um, Most commentating on Raw. And now, yeah, he's got his own podcast, got his own uh, wrestling school, wrestling organization. I believe it's called Reality of Wrestling, I believe. So, yeah, he's definitely uh, killing it in the in the game of wrestling. Uh, the, oh, it's back on track. Uh, the very next match was to determine the number one contender for the WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team Championship. Uh, yeah, so only the week before at the Greed pay view they brought in the Cruiserweight Tag Team Championship. Um, that was determined through a tournament on the previous weeks and the winners of the tournament ended up being Alex Skipper and Kid Romeo. 
So yeah, the winner of this match would get a title shot at them on this final Nitro. And the teams were three count, which was Evan Courageous and Shannon Moore. The Young Dragons, which which was Kaz Hayashi and Yang. And then the Filthy Animals, which was Rey Mysterio Jr. and Billy Kidman. The match was pretty quick. Everyone hit all their spots and finishes. It only lasted three minutes, 37 seconds. The victors were the Filthy Animals. So later on, that same show, yeah, Rey Mysterio and Kidman would get a title shot. Uh, the next match, it was Sugar Shane Helms defending his Cruiserweight Championship against Chavo Guerrero Jr. Uh, Shane Helms came out. He had this whole, like, new theme music. Was rapping about vertebrakers. I'm going to break your spine, a vertebraker. And then he's talking about his background, and he's pretty much rapping the whole video um, walkout. And then... He had a bunch of uh, dance girls with him called the Sugar Babes, who I wasn't able to look into it, but as far as I know, the Sugar Babes look like the Nitro Girls, which were basically the Nitro Girls were very popular in the late 90s, coming out, dancing in between uh, matches during the commercial breaks of the crowd. Um, and then, yeah, then Vince Russo and Eric Bishop tried to add them into storylines, and a lot of them were pretty much forced to wrestle and if they didn't wrestle they should leave the company so some of them stayed around and some of them even like Stacey Keebler was formed through the Nitro Girls so if it was for Nitro Girls Stacey Keebler play wouldn't have been in WCW after and wouldn't have been in WF after and then she got some notoriety later on basically being uh, going on Dancing with the Stars and also known to be uh, a girlfriend of George Clooney's um, but yeah, she was very popular at the end of WCW and in her early WF days. Um, yeah, I'll speak more about Stacy in a second. Um, but the next match, it was the natural born thrillers defending their tag team title against team Canada. So at the time, the natural born thrillers was Sean O'Hare and Chuck Palumbo. Uh, team Canada was Mike Awesome and Lance Storm. Uh, this match only went for 3 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, the Natural Born Thrillers end up defending the title. Um, in case you see this constant theme here, a lot of these matches were advertised on the previous Nitro. However, all these matches were pretty brief just due to now that the new plan was WF had taken over. So they had to fit in all their segments because during all these segments, it was mostly Vincent Mann bragging about now owning WCW as well as um, talking down about certain WCW wrestlers in each segment and there was also the segments that were involving like Trish Stratus and uh, William Regal and Michael Cole and yeah they squeezed in nearly a segment in between each match of WF related content um, yeah so the match was always going to be pretty tight considering that Nitro is down to two hours here so yeah these, none of these matches would be going down as classics, but they're just getting the guys that were advertised and onto the TV screen as well as all the titles defended. So, um, yeah, the very next match, uh, it was advertised to happen. So I had a feeling if it wasn't advertised, it probably wouldn't have had it happen. But basically it was Sean Stazak accompanied by Stacey Keebler who at the time they were a TV couple. Uh, they were versing Bam Bam Bigelow. And if Sean Stasiak lost, he'd have to get his head shaved and tattooed by Bam Bam after the match. Um, yeah, that was never happening. Um, yeah, the match lasted a minute 24. Sean Stasiak won. Um, yeah, I could see why they feuded, but I can also see why the match was going to end up how it did. Um, at this time in WCW's, uh, or in Bam Bam's WCW run here, he was a little bit out of shape compared to what he used to be. Um, yeah, he wasn't in the best shape. He, he'd play a minute back then. Um, and yeah, and Sean Stasek never put on like a five-star match. So yeah, it was definitely going to go that way. And at least they kept it short, but yeah, they could have done without this match and probably could have easily done another match possibly involving some other guys that weren't on this card like Jeff Jarrett or Buff Bagwell or Lex Luger 
Um, the next match, it was for the Tag Team Championship. Um, yeah, the champs, Elix Skipper and Kid Romeo defended their belt against the Filthy Animals, Rey Mysterio Jr. and Billy Kidman. Uh, it lasted 4 minutes 43 seconds with the Filthy Animals being the new Cruiserweight Tag Team Champions. Uh, the belts were pretty ugly. Um, I could see why they sort of pushed for a Cruiserweight Tag Team division just because there were so many Cruiserweights on the sh- on like all in WCW at the time. But yeah, you could see it wasn't going to uh, go over to WF, but yeah, it was pretty cool to see them with the belts. And I'm wondering if those two guys have those belts on their walls or something. But yeah, they they end up being the very last Cruiserweight Tag Team Champions. Uh, yeah, the final match of the card was, yeah, the main event, Sting versus Ric Flair. Um, it was a lot different compared to their usual matches. Uh, when they had matches in the past, they'd go for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and there'd be deep hate between them because obviously they were always rivals. They are always in feuds. They are always good guy versus bad guy. And in this one, they sort of were smiling at each other, each sort of move and each sort of spot that they showed. Yeah, it just simply ended with um, both of them doing all their usual spots. Uh, Sting doing his not... Uh, doing his thing where he gets a knife edge chop and he's unaffected and he starts banging his chest like a caveman and Ric Flair doing his usual spots like fall into the crown face first and yeah and it was Sting doing the Scorpion Deathlock Ric Flair tapping in 7 minutes 19 seconds and then that was the very last match in WCW Nitro history and yeah ended the match with them two embracing and having both their arms raised and yeah and then the, the show itself um, ended with uh, simulcast, which was done by Vince McMahon and WF. So basically, um, the segment it was going to be shown live to Nitro and live to the crowd for Raw, which was uh, held at the same time in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Vince McMahon ended up saying a bunch of names, trying to get crowd reactions from the uh, people in Cleveland on who should he bring in. Um, the guys with the biggest applause to get brought in was like Sting, Goldberg, and even Buff Bagwell. Um, the most negative really was like maybe Hogan and Lex Luger when their names got mentioned. Um, yeah, and then the whole segment was built on Vince McMahon stating that at WrestleMania, which was the week after, He wanted Ted Turner to be there in person and give him the contract to sign so he'd be the owner of the WCW uh, storyline-wise. At the time, Vince was feuding with Shane, his son. Um, Yeah, and then end up Shane's music played. Vince was getting ready to fight him, supposedly, but Shane wasn't in Cleveland, Ohio. Shane was in Panama City, Florida. And then supposedly he signed the contract, so now he owned WCW. And that was the that was the end of the show. Really, it just looked like Shane bought WCW and what was going to happen next. Now, I remember a couple of days later, I even went on WCW.com and tried to be like how to get access to it and stuff like that. And then I, I typed WCW.com, it go directed to a WWF page, and it was like a Shane McMahon message, and then that was it. So that was what the page was reverted to. So um, yeah, that's the very last WCW Nitro so hope you enjoyed this podcast guys you can listen to any podcast platform um, you can also follow me on all social media you can watch me on my YouTube channel and um, yeah until the next one thank you for listening to the Troy Perry podcast